and a hush came over the crowd. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here for this uh, an amazing and uh, well-deserved event. Uh, my name is Gil Stork. I'm the president of Cuesta College, and uh, I want to welcome you on behalf of, of Cuesta College and our foundation, and also um, <clears throat> from the Community Foundation. We really appreciate this, this partnership. I wanted to uh, uh, introduce a few people that are really instrumental in making sure that this uh, place continues to run the way we want it to run. We have uh, two of our trustees that are here today, um, Dr. Barbara George. Barbara, you are right there, right? Thank you. And also at the same table is trustee uh, Dick Hitchman. Hey, Dick. Thank you. And I would be remiss if I didn't recognize uh, one of the stalwarts for the board for a long, long time, and that's uh, Gay Galvin. Where's Gay? The Gay's way in the back over there. <laughs> I think she's been on every school board in the country, I think. <laughs> well, I want to focus a little bit on um, on some history of this event. But before I do that, some of us, uh, as you were walking around getting food and so on, you might have heard this wonderful music being played. And I wanted to say thank you to Talia, Matthew, and Madison from our jazz program, Cuesta College. Thank you. <clears throat> well, how has Cuesta College been involved in the Women's uh, History Month and Women of Distinction Ceremony? Uh, Cuesta College's participation in recognizing women in history actually started before Congress uh, passed the national designation. In the mid-1970s, Cuesta College held a women's conference, an all-day event uh, with a keynote speaker to promote women as leaders and to understand the role of women in history. Over the years, the event evolved into including awards. The first award was given in 1987 and Arlene Chandler was the first to be recognized as the Women of the Year. In 1990, after Dr. Mitchell came on board as the president, the program expanded to four awards, a Progress for Women, Community and Public Service, Professional Community and, and Public Service Volunteer, and Women in Education. And later, some of the awards were named in honor of, of important people, the Women in Education, was named in honor of Dr. Susan Dressler, who was a former vice president of instruction. The Women in Philanthropy, which was a new award added, was named in honor of Dr. Barbara George, our former executive director of our foundation. And then ultimately, the Lifetime Achievement Award was added in honor of Dr. Grace uh, Mitchell, who was the third president at Cuesta College. So depending upon who was in charge, the program morphed each year. It was on Saturdays, then it became a week-long event, then a few days, then back to a Saturday, and then in 2005 was moved to a Friday lunch, and then finally as a reception. In 2014, a partnership with Cuesta College, the Community Foundation of San Luis Obispo County Women's Legacy Fund was formed to continue to raise awareness and, rec and recognize the contribution that women have made in the areas of volunteering in the community their profession, and in philanthropy. This year marks the 39th Women in Distinction Ceremony. And I was so honored last year that I was made an honorary woman of distinction last year. <laughs> and you, you don't realize the discussions that leads to with my 10 grandchildren as to when they see that award, they go, Papa, what are you really, what is that really saying, you know? And so I said, it's, it's an honor. It's an honor to be recognized in relationship to what this event means, not only for Cuesta College, but for our community. So thank you for being here today, and I'll turn it over to your MC today, Suzanne Parker. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Suzanne Parker from PG&E, and I am a legacy leader on the Women's Legacy Fund Committee. And I am incredibly honored to be here today in the presence of so many admirable and tireless community leaders. 
And let me be among those who wish you a very happy St. Patrick's Day. In honor of the day, the rest of my remarks will be in Gaelic. <clears throat> Just kidding. I know everybody prefers Welsh. But uh, truly, as a descendant of Irish immigrants, as noted by my significant absence of melanin and general coloring, <clears throat> this holiday has a personal connection for me. But there are other celebrations this month that bear even more significance for me as a woman. We recently celebrated International Women's Day on March 8th, and March is also Women's History Month in the US. So 1987 was a big year. Not only did we start the Women of Distinction Awards, uh, the month of March since 1987 has been proclaimed as a tribute to generations of women who have made huge and invaluable contributions to society. So it's especially fitting for us to be here today to honor the inspirational commitments and contributions of an esteemed group of local women who have made contributions in areas of volunteerism in the community, their professions, and in philanthropy. And before I go any further, I know that you've seen uh, we had the names of some of our previous year's Women of Distinction scrolling on our screen. But will our past award recipients please stand up to be recognized? Thank you. Now, I have been lucky enough to call San Luis Obispo County home for about eight years now. And one of the things that I have found most appealing about this region, you know, apart from the natural beauty and the fabulous climate and world-class educational opportunities, is the spirit of community. Now, to follow a theme, there's an old Irish proverb that people live in each other's shelter. And I see that here. So when you look at the spirit of service that pervades this place, you see how there are people and organizations and systems that are there to ensure a better quality of life for us all. Now, particularly in an election year, it's really easy to talk in fancy rhetoric about big societal issues and to point out failings or shortcomings, but it's so important that we take the time to celebrate the successes and encourage the people who are working on the big issues every day. And I'm so glad that we're here to support each other and work together to be forces of change. And the truth is, none of us is here today because we made it on our own. We're all here because somebody has given us strength. And we help each other because we're a community. And it feels fantastic to be part of a group that has contributors like these who make this region such a darn fine place. So let's get to why we're here, the celebration. In addition to the awards, each winner is going to be receiving recognition from local, state, and national levels. And so at this time, I'd like to introduce the elected representatives who are with us today. And for the four of you who will be participating in the program, please come up to the chairs in front as I introduce you. First, we have Betsy Umhofer from Representative Lois Capps' office. We also have Kevin Bomarito from Senator Bill Monning's office. Welcome to Vicki Jansen from Assemblyman Kacha Achajian's office. And representing our Board of Supervisors, Supervisor Bruce Gibson. Now our first award today is for community and public service by a professional. And this is awarded to a woman who has, by virtue of her profession, distinguished herself by outstanding professional service to the community. And right now, I'd like to invite Bob Watt up to the stage to introduce this year's award winner, Lisa Frazier. Will you both please come up?
My name is Bob Watt, and I'm the uh, honored presenter of Lisa today. I'm the president of the board for the child of our, the Center for Family Strengthening. Um, I'm very proud to be asked to present Lisa for, as a woman of distinction, and I want everyone to take a minute to think about the woman of distinction in your life. Just maybe take 15 seconds. You know, I think about my mom and my wife and my daughters and many others. And Lisa told me once a long time ago, probably almost 15 years ago, that there's an old uh, saying in the nonprofit world that you don't get fed unless you come to the table. And Lisa comes to the table all the time, and oftentimes she's at the head of the table. Lisa is the director of the Center for Family Strengthening since 2001. She distinguishes herself with her vision to create and grow nine major programs, each designed to strengthen families and, stock, and stop the cycle of child abuse. She also serves as board president of the Alpha Pregnancy and Parenting Support and as a board member of The Link, which provides services to children's youth and families. Lisa is a preeminent leader in Slow County's human service field. While her legacy has had a tremendous impact on our Slow County community, Lisa's talents and her commitment to families are recognized on a regional and state level. She established the Regional Child Death Review Team, which I sit on in our county, and it is not an easy thing, and she should be specifically honored for this chore. In addition to that, she established it for the counties of Ventura, San Luis Obispo, and on the California state level. The Center for Family Strength and Unique Programs support the needs of children and families and make a difference in their lives. The Parent Connection has helped families has helped parents improve their parenting skills, create greater family unity, and instill self-discipline in children. Postpartum depression support provides emotional support to more than 500 women. The Kids Toolbox for Personal Safety educates children with self-protective and safety skills each year. And each year, they come up to the grammar school in Cambria, where I'm the principal, and serve our kindergartners and second graders for, for years and years. And if I don't line it up, I get scolded. Beginnings of San Luis Obispo educates students and community members each year about the negative impacts of prenatal substance use on the developing child. Mandated reporter children of suspected child abuse is another of her accomplishments. The Promotoris Collaborative, which is a thriving, innovative program that we've been building for five or six years now, is, 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 her, is her brainchild. It builds healthy families through Spanish-speaking volunteer advocates working with our community. Dental care for kids makes dental care accessible to children who do not qualify for medical coverage and cannot afford services. Advisory Community Board for Nurse Family Partnership helps at risk mothers and healthy pregnancy, to, to have healthy pregnancies. And finally, a partnership for excellence and family support. The network of 14 family resource centers providing families with high quality services and opportunities to to thrive. This has been a goal of ours for a long time to unify all of us providing family support, and Lisa has been the spearhead of this. Lisa earned a BS degree and a single subject teacher credential, and she never should have left the teaching profession, by the way. <laughs> she also earned a professional certification, including California Standards for Family Strengthening and Support Certification, California Mandated Reporter Suspected Child Abuse Certification, Nonprofit Developmental Center Officer Program Certification and a certificate to facilitate leadership interaction, excuse me, facilitate leadership interaction institute for social change. Lisa loves the community spirit of the Central Coast where she and Larry, her husband of 31 years, have raised two children, Brooke and Dylan. She is an avid tennis player and active in social organizations and the arts. With the phrase, advocate for women, children, and families comes to mind, nobody fits the bill more than Lisa Frazier. Lisa has dedicated her entire professional career to assisting women, children, and families. She is a visionary, a change agent, someone who grasps the big picture while making systematic change. She is humble. She is the most humble person I've ever met in a leadership position. She is not motivated by recognition, and if she was, could tell you right now, she would be up, she'd say, I don't want to do this, you know? Uh, certainly not ego or money. Lisa is a perfect candidate for a Women of Distinction Award, and I'm so proud to present her to you today. Well, I'm 
very lucky to have a board president like Bob Watt, and thank you, Bob, for being part of the group. I remember the day he came up and asked me if he could be on the board, and I just went, yes, please, come join us. And, and I want to just say good afternoon, everyone. I am so deeply honored and grateful to receive this award, and I want to thank the Women's Legacy Fund, the Community Foundation, and Cuesta College for making this opportunity possible. To me, it's a validation of all the good work, the Center for Family Strengthening, and our partnership with Family Resource Centers have accomplished in our community. It is a testimony to, that our, our partner agencies are actively working closely together to strengthen our families and to protect our children and our youth. I was reminded of this again last week when I received an invoice for our Dental Care for Kids project. It's an innovative partnership with the San Luis Obispo County Public Health Department. The invoice was passed on to me by Janice Babos. She's a public health nurse and supervisor of the Child Health Disability Prevention Program. Janice wrote, hello, Lisa. Here's the final invoice for number 17. This four-year-old child's dental health is now fully restored. Dr. Duffy DeGraw, he's one of our partner de dentists, loved doing this for this little girl. Helping this child involved a partner family resource center, a first five health navigator, Myra Valencia. Myra translated for this child and transported her. Myra personally eliminated the communication barriers that the family faced in obtaining dental care. We have recently expanded this Dental Care for Kids project with a generous grant from the Community Foundation. We are so grateful, and it is working. The Women of Distinction Award is, a wonder, is wonderful to receive, and I will, and I am enjoying this honor. But it's, let's move on, and I would like to talk to you about the future. Let me take this opportunity to let you know how we can me better make it possible for our families to thrive in San Luis Obispo County. And I'm going to share three short examples. But I want you to know that there are many additional programs we must strive for as we go on to, into the future. First, I want to bring to your attention our program known as Parent Connection. We must hire one more additional parent coach in the coming months for our Latino communities. The community is telling us that this is a very successful program. Secondly, I submit that we must improve and augment the parent connection, which I've talked about, by expanding our Promotoris Collaborative. This excellent program builds leadership skills and advocacy for and within our Latino community. And thirdly, I must share the good news. Today, our community is becoming more aware of the high incidence of postpartum depression. I am so pleased for all of us that we are beginning to remove the stigma of postpartum depression. This awareness has coincidentally but not unexpectedly resulted in substantial increase of women and their families coming forward with their struggles and with a range of postpartum health needs. We must recognize that when women reach out to us, they and their families are already at a crisis point. We must continue to create multiple approaches to reach these women and their families sooner so they can recognize the symptoms of depression and seek help sooner. And as a final step in dealing with postpartum depression, we collectively know that we need qualified people in our community standing by, ready to support these women and their families emotionally through a baby's first year to help create a solid foundation for that baby. While these initiatives are the ones that I see that are the next top priorities, I recognize that many of you also have your top three must happen next steps. It's imperative that we all move to identify all of our next steps and come together to find and assign the resources to bring them to life in our community. I am so thrilled to have received this award as a validation of all the great work that the Center for Family Strengthening and our partner agencies have accomplished in strengthening families in our community, and thank you so much.
And our second award for community and public service by a volunteer. <clears throat> this award is presented to a woman who has distinguished herself as a volunteer by providing outstanding service to the community. And so I'd like to invite Pearl Munak to introduce this year's award winner, Sherry Michelson. Will you both please join me on stage? Sherry Michelson is president of Paso Cares, a nonprofit that operates on a shoestring with volunteer staff. The mission of Paso Cares, its first objective, was to set up a warming shelter for homeless people sleeping outdoors on very cold and rainy nights, camping in the riverbed. We tried for three years to find a place. We had no money to buy land or build or rent, no grants and just a few donations. We could not find anything and were about to give up. Sherry became president and got us some churches to donate space, starting with the church which one of the board members attended. When the other churches saw that, more came in. We alternate among the churches. Rules were adopted by the board the homeless people are screened at a supper program operated by another agency at another church. The head of that program is in the audience. The woman who operates the supper program at Second Baptist on behalf of Transitional Food and Shelter. There she is, Liz Cole, please stand. <laughs> You're short, I can't see you. She's another heroine. For transportation, Sherry got ride on to make an extra trip in the evening to take them to the warming shelter and another in the morning to take them back with Paso Cares paying their expenses. It's a real thrill to see that big van pull up at the church, see all the people get off with their things, carrying the Paso Cares equipment, unroll the big tarp to cover the church floor, lie down and go to sleep, all safe and dry and warm. The clients set everything up themselves, get clean and get ready for the bus in the morning. They clean the bathroom, everything's ready. Paso Cares pays a little money to a homeless man to get the van properly loaded with the right people and equipment in the evening. The equipment is kept in a shed bought by Paso Cares. Two volunteer chaperones supervise throughout the night, but take turns sleeping on a cot. The program can take up to 12 homeless people a night. Right around the time Sherry became president, her husband died unexpectedly, but she soldiered on. She got us the churches, the ride on, set everything up, took care of all the details. Then, once it was set up from Monday through Fridays, the days when the supper program operated, it seemed a shame to leave people out in the cold and the rain on weekends. So Sherry created a weekend supper program at the same place and got another church to donate shelter space on the weekends. At the same time, all this time, Sherry had been operating a lunch program called Sandwiches on Sundays to take care of the one day when the churches were too busy to serve lunch. She also operates RVs for Veterans, which she took over from another agency. They have just donated their 51st donated RV to a needy veteran to live in. Sherry worked with Mayor Steve Martin of Paso Robles to set up a sort of fair where agencies would all come together and offer their services to the homeless for one day, and they're going to do it again. I heard one man say, he and his dog both got their shots. Another was so happy to get an ID. He said, now I can stay in a motel. Sherry, a caterer by trade, cooked lunch for all the homeless people and all the agency representatives. Sherry tells me she has been destination oriented. That's a good thing because she got all these programs into operation. Now she wants to become more 
process oriented and she can do that because she has them in operation. She got Paso Cares to its destination and not a moment too soon because the river is rising. Congratulations, Sherry, on being named Woman of Distinction. Um, I prefer to remain in the back door, I guess, kind of person, so I really didn't prepare anything. I usually just speak from my heart and hope that it works out okay. Um, I'm very, very honored. You have no idea when I walked in here. I were all sitting here crying as soon as we walked in. I have such a huge support system. Um, my board, the community, it's just phenomenal. Um, I have a really good thing about remembering people's names one time, so I think that helps a lot. Um, I'm also a good multitasker as my phone is constantly going all the time. Um, homeless is not something people want to talk about or deal with, um, but it's out there. It's out there to stay, unfortunately. We're able to bring um, 12 in um, and and make them feel safe and make them feel warm and make them feel loved. And that's the most important thing that I think we as Paso Cares and as a community can do for these people. And then to reach out to them and extend services to them to help them to um, dignify their lives a little bit more, to move on and to become an active member in our community once again. Um, we're not forgetting them. I'm not forgetting them. They all have a huge place in my heart. Um, they have my back. They're a wonderful group of people. We have a lot of regular people. Um, unfortunately, you know, you see the children, and that's very hard. In Paso, we don't have right now any children in the riverbed, as far as I know, so that's a good thing. Um, but the programs are all, they're all, the, they're, the, the churches are all faith-based. Um, we put the program into action, and that's why I think it's working. We did all the legwork. We did all the legalities, and I think that's why these churches have come forward and been so generous with giving us what I said was all I need is a floor, a bathroom, and a roof, that, and we'll supply everything else. And they've done that, and they've gone beyond that. Ride On has been phenomenal. Um, just they've, I just can't say enough about Ride On and their staff that has worked with this because we're not open every single night, and um, you know we just give them a 48-hour window. Um, if they're late, they'll call me, say that they're late, that the driver's late. Um, it's just been a really... Um, humbling experience to be a part of this and I'm very grateful to be with Paso Cares and some of my group over here. Thank you everybody very much. Very grateful. Our next award is the Progress for Women Award. And this is awarded to a woman whose commitment to a particular program or issue of special relevance to women who has helped, has helped to improve the quality of life for women. And with that, I'll ask Maggie Cox to please come up to the stage with this year's award winner, Anita Robinson. I'll let you get up here. Thank you. I am honored to get a, a few minutes to tell you a little bit about Anita Robinson. And I want to begin by acknowledging my co-nominator in this process, Chip Vichy, who's here with us today. I wanted to thank him very much uh, for his help. The printed program gives you an idea about Anita Robinson and her, her vast professional experience, 42 years in banking. Uh, she started as a teller at a very young age and she has since become president and CEO of two different community banks, one of which she founded to create programs and support for people who are underserved. That's what she brings to her belief in banking. I met Anita shortly after she arrived in San Luis Obispo about 27 years ago, and uh, I remember she had big hair, big hair. <laughs> we had big hair. But she also had drive and ambition, and she jumped in so fast and so furiously in this community. She was 
on committees and boards, lending her time to things. She eventually became the chairman of the board for the San Luis Chamber, did two stints on the board. She helped create the Housing Trust Fund. She served on the Capslow Board for 15 years, trying to end poverty in our community. Uh, she helped create and sustain the economic forecast project in this community. She's been a chair of that program and also continues on the board, on and on and on. Along the way, she's gotten some awards with some really cool names. I just had to mention a couple of them. Things like Trailblazer of the Year, Influential Latino, Women in Business Champion, given by the Small Business Administration. But I want to tell you about the person, the person behind all that success and those accolades, because I've had the pleasure of knowing Anita for years and seeing firsthand what her, her tenacity and her compassion and her unending commitment have produced in this community, and I want to share a little bit about that. First thing you need to know about Anita Robinson is she is fierce about family, and they're all here today, and, and we're so happy to have you here. She attributes that commitment to family to her late grandmother, whom she adored. Uh, her grandmother was a domestic who worked in New Mexico, and Anita would visit her in the summers and go with her, tag along with her to her work, and learned at her grandmother's knee, first of all, the profound importance of family, and secondly, the imperative of a strong work ethic, and it has borne out her entire life. Anita is feisty. She is not afraid to share her opinion. She's not afraid on a board to be the one no vote, and that's not easy to do. She is also endlessly optimistic and amazingly resilient, and, and I would venture to say that 42 years in an industry like banking, you better be resilient, because they have been through the ringer. But there's a little personal anecdote I wanted to share about her that really speaks, I think, volumes about that resiliency and how it plays out. Ten years ago, um, Anita and her husband's home burned to the ground in Atascadero. They lost everything. And they were basically going through the rubble, and she found a shoe that had belonged to her husband, who was a very accomplished high school and college athlete. She found this shoe. Now, honestly, I think if my house had burned to the ground and I found a shoe, I'd say, really? I lost my whole house and all I've got left is a shoe? She grabbed that shoe and she had it framed in a shadow box and gifted it to Brian as a souvenir, the, the one remaining souvenir of this phenomenal football career. That's how she takes something and sees what's next with it. And I, I just have never, never forgotten that. She's always been a champion for women, always been a champion for women, especially women who have a tougher hill to climb. Um, in her banking career, she has created programs. She has built services for women, bilingual programs, women starting businesses quietly, personally. She hangs in there and one-on-one -on -one keeps women afloat. Just phenomenal. Now I get talking, I lost my place. Hang on. Oh, I know. I want to tell you she has a huge, huge heart. During the recession, I think nobody probably felt the recession like she did because she worked endlessly, late nights, weekends, to the sole purpose of he keeping her customers afloat so they wouldn't lose their homes, so they wouldn't lose their businesses. That's what she brings to her job. And then finally, I want to mention when she was the uh, president of the California Bankers Association, and notably the first woman in 100 years to hold that title. She was ending her term and she wanted to leave something, a, a legacy project behind her. And she, she thought about it and she created this phenomenal program that continues, I think it's now six years later, six years later, called Women in Banking. What's the point of Women in Banking? Well, she wanted to give women, sort of mid-level women in banking, the opportunity that she had, the opportunity to learn and to grow and to achieve something in banking. And so she created a one-day conference that today has over 100 women who come together and learn leadership skills, management techniques, and the other um, attributes they need or the other skills they need to be able to go on to be very successful bankers. That's the kind of, of vision Anita has. She takes something that's hers and she finds a way to share it and elevate everybody in it. Um, I can tell you she has a wicked sense of humor she is a fabulous dancer. You don't want to be next to her at a concert at the Mid-State Fair, I'll tell you that. Um, she is, has had an amazing impact on our community, and I am honored to be her colleague 
and even more grateful to be her friend and very, very proud to introduce the Progress for Women Award winner, Anita Robinson. I'm not even sure I know what to say. Goodness. Um, thank you, Maggie. And thank you, Chip. Just, uh, I was absolutely stunned when I found out I was um, nominated and uh, was going to receive this award. And um, I look around and I see the women before me who have been honored. And it's just, uh, it's, it's, I've been excited. I've been really excited. Well, I've had the pleasure of working with so many of you in so many different ways, including Maggie and Chip. And, you know, along the way, we build uh, not just our working relationships, but we also become friends. And I'm grateful for all of that as well. I'm uh, really proud to accept this honor today. But I want to take a moment and talk just a little bit about my family which Maggie was so right, is really number one in my book. Um, and I was told I had about a minute, so now I'm thinking I had longer, and, I, and I'm going to make it short, though, anyway. It, Maggie commented about my grandmother, and yes, my grandmother had a tremendous work ethic, like, n like not anything you could imagine, having a, uh, seven children of her own. She was crippled. She was a domestic. She was the breadwinner in the family. And they were very poor. And you never heard her complain. You never heard her uh, talk about anything that was negative. She just worked harder, and she just got it done. She was, she was the example. And I look back, and it doesn't matter what your role is. You know, it, it's a matter of thinking about your work ethic. Get it done. Don't complain. There are people around you who have it far worse, and you know you also are empowered to help others. So, you know, we came here in 1989, built some wonderful friendships, um, and yes, we've had some some challenges along the way. My husband Brian, who's been with me for the past 33 years, thank you, honey. It's he allows me to do the work that I love to do. And then together we have our son, Brennan. Brennan, who is here with his wife, Jessica, who I'm so proud of. And Brennan, some of you will have, have witnessed this. Used to, I used to drag him off to some of my meetings and put him in the corner with a, a book or colors or whatever. And he would sit very quietly and attend the meetings with me. And then, you know, we would go on. And occasionally I made him put on a suit and a tie. And, and he'd have to put the name tag on, and he'd have to escort me to things like this because maybe his dad was out of town working. And so he grew up with me through all of, all of this. And here, um, he's now a banker along with me, and I'm very happy to see his face every day working with me. And Jessica, in her own right, has become a strong woman, and she does amazing things for other women. And we've, I've watched her grow over the years. And I can't help but say I'm very proud of you, dear. Now, my dear friend Nancy, who's sitting next to Brian, is Brennan's other mom. So when you're working full time, and Brian had a job where he was, um, he was working offshore, so he worked seven days. He was gone seven days, and he was home seven days. So it was being a single parent every other week. And I worked hard not to miss any of the sports events, the school events, you know, making sure I was home to get the homework done and such. Nancy had him by day in, in daycare, and so I call, I call her the other mother, and we've become dear, dear friends over the years. So what I do, I do because I love it, and it is really, really very um, rewarding when I get to help other women or, or people who just need help in figuring out the financials, how to start a business, you know, what to do once they're in business. You know, there's so many different ways that we can help, and that's the way that I contribute back, al among other ways. And 
there are so many um, businesses that I've had the opportunity to watch and grow here on the Central Coast that I had the chance to help them along the way. And that's, that's very rewarding. And finally, I would just say that, you know, I hope I get to do this for many, many more years. And um, it wouldn't be so much fun if I didn't get to do it along with all of you. So thank you very much for this, re this award. It's very powerful. Thank you. So for our next award, it's the Women in Education Award. And there was a small issue with the printing of the programs, and so it contains an important and unfortunate errata. Uh, it says that the award winner is Susan Dressler, but actually the award is named in honor of Susan Dressler. And so it, it is our privilege to present this award to Anna Bates. But let's welcome Amber Bier to the stage with this year's award winner for this special award that's not given every year, but brought back this year for our very special recipient, Anna Bates. Good afternoon. My name is Amber Bier, and I'm currently a senior at San Luis Obispo High School, where Mrs. Bates is my teacher. Anna Bates is an exemplary member of our San Luis Obispo community. As a teacher and mentor to high school girls, she teaches us confidence, poise, a sense of pride, and the importance of first impressions. She gives them direction and focus while in high school, and gives them skills that will carry with them throughout life. She takes them under her wing and helps mold them into some of the most outstanding young adults you will ever meet. I have had the pleasure of watching her in action as she is my teacher on a day-to-day -day basis. Mrs. Bates has been a teacher in the Agricultural Education and FFA Department of San Luis Obispo High School since 2002. She is a graduate of Cal Poly San Luis Obispo with a Bachelor of Science in Agri Animal Science and Master's in Agricultural Education. She is currently obtaining a PhD in agricultural education through Doctor at Distance through Texas A&M and Texas Tech. And in 2015, she was awarded the Outstanding doc Distance Doctoral pro Student in her program. Mrs. Bates's profession professional accolades include California State FFA Star Advisor Award, Teacher of Excellence for the South Coast Region FFA, National FFA Chapter Award winner, California Agriculture Teachers Association Outstanding Program, Outstanding Program Award, National Association of Agriculture Educa Educators, and the San Luis Obispo Tribune Top 20 Under 40 Award winner. Anna teaches a full load of classes in the agriculture department, ranging from leadership to veterinary science to integrated science, and recently created a new curriculum for a veterinary science class that is approved by the Cal University of California system. She also advises the FFA chapter officers, one of which I am. In addition, she goes on home visits to meet the families of her freshman students. This extra mile is something that Anna is well known for. She involves her students and their families into activities in the agriculture department year after year. She has done over 900 home visits in the last 10 years. Mrs. Bates has also coached and mentored many individuals and teams in FFA competitions ranging from veterinary science to parliamentary procedure debate and countless public speaking events. Through her coaching and mentoring, these individuals and teams have garnered a plethora of awards. These include the state and national champion novice parliamentary teams in 2012, 2013, and 2014, the state and national champion veterinary science team in 2014, and reserve champion creed speaker in 2014. More than the titles, Mrs. Bates teaches teamwork, self-confidence, public speaking, the value of hard work and practice, and a maturity level that sometimes makes it hard to believe that these students are only in high school. While everything Mrs. Bates does professionally speaks volumes about her character, what truly exemplifies Mrs. Bates is, what is her dedication to her family, which includes her husband and two young boys, as well as to her friends. 
No matter how busy she may be, she always has a smile on her face and an upbeat attitude that is infectious. She is an ideal role model for all women lucky enough to know her. I'm beyond proud to welcome Mrs. Anna Bates to the stage. Hello. Um, thank you so much. I, I, I'm honored. I'm surprised. I, um, if you had asked me several years ago if I would be here today getting this award, I would have probably laughed. Um, and I, it's very hard to stand here and listen to someone who's 18 read this whole thing about you and um, think about, gosh, we've done a lot of things. Um, her and I together, and also for m myself in this career as an ag teacher. And I, I, I was sitting there thinking, what should I talk about? Um, and the, I have two questions that I, I get asked most often. Number one is, how did you become an ag teacher? Because I am from Huntington Beach. I grew up, <laughs> I grew up where we, I had no idea what FFA was, what agriculture really meant. Um, I liked animals, and so I went to Cal Poly to be a veterinarian. And after four years of taking all the science classes on Earth and um, volunteering and doing my time in vet clinics, I realized that was not what I wanted to do. And so I went to the counselors and, and at Cal Poly, and I said, strange thing. I like animals and teenagers. And the counselor, because I had been a WOW counselor and a... An, a an RA in the dorms, and they said, well, have you ever thought about being an ag teacher? And I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. And so lucky for me, they sent me to a, a well-known man, if any of you know Dr. Joe Sable, um, in our community. And uh, needless to say, I walked into his office, and the rest is history. And so recently, um, he's the local ap apple grafting man, if you know him. Um, he came to graft apples with one of our classes this past week, and we have done the same thing over and over again. I could probably even mimic his routine with the kids, how he tells them how I barely passed college, and um, that I was in his class, and I only stabbed myself once with a knife and all this stuff, the grafting knife. And uh, this time, though, he had something really special that he had planned, and he was so excited to do it. Um, he pulled out this poster board and told the kids, and it was a freshman class, so, you know, they didn't know what was going on. Um, pulled out this poster board, and it was a poster board that I had made when I was a student in his class, like, 17 years ago. Um, and it was about apple grafting, and I was like, if I could ever be that good to have these projects that kids made me so long ago, knowing that these kids were going to be, or my students were going to be um, making an impact on others. And so um, I am so lucky and blessed to be in this profession. For those of you that don't know what FFA and ag education is, FFA is a leadership organization based on the foundation of agriculture. And so that is what I tell all these parents at these home visits. Um, I've had a lot of numbers roll around about how many home visits I've done. I don't really even know how many I've done. And um, it's something that I, I think that I've tried to instill in other people um, who are going into teaching because I firmly believe that once you know what's going on with the student in their home, that it will help you in your immensely in your classroom. And I've seen kids that you would never, ever think, um, and this girl's special, but I never thought she would be on a debate team. Um, and she has now been on the national winning debate team, two of them, on my national winning parliamentary procedure team, or on my vet team. Um, and now she's going to some big school to do big things. But um, I take pride in all the extra time I get to spend with these kids. And so it's truly a blessing. Now, my second most commonly asked question is, how do you do it all? Um, quite frankly, it was a rush for me to get over here pick up my child, drag him to my husband's work, put on a dress, try to remain cool, and sit down while I have this amazing table of people sitting here. Um, my, uh, there's several people over here at my table um, from my school district, uh, my principal, and uh, two, uh, two individuals from our district office who 
I incredibly support what we do. Um, and then my coworker, who's probably off at a baseball game somewhere, um, Jody Evans. We are a duo and a team, and definitely she is also a very distinct woman um, for this uh, award as well. And lastly, um, my mom, this is the hard one, is amazing. And everyone says, how do you do it all? Because I have an amazing mom and dad who have taught, who've taught me to work hard. And um, sorry, we don't ever see each other. All she does is take care of my kids for me. <laughs> um, but uh, it's a, a blessing to have her as a role model. So I'm, I'm honored here to have her and my mom and my amazing husband, who's also he amazing guy too. So. Thank you so much. I thought I was going to make it, but she's sitting there crying. So, <laughs> thank you. To the fan. The fan. And so we have another award that is not presented every year, but it is given this year to honor a very deserving person. This is the Barbara George Women in Philanthropy Award. And so at this time, I'd like to invite Barbara Bell to the stage with this year's award winner, Libby Agren. Everybody. In the 13 short years since Libby Agron moved to the county with her husband Guy, she's made a lifetime of contributions on the Central Coast. As a board member with the Foundation for the Performing Arts Center, Libby led the successful Encore campaign, doubling the endowment, and continues to lead, having established the Clifton Swanson Performing Arts Fund that provides grants for local nonprofits using the Performing Arts Center. Using her financial expertise, Libby has assisted the State Park's Natural History Center to restore and improve the Spooner House at Montana de Oro, one of the few remaining dairy homes in this historically rich dairy farming area. She has coached the Women's Legacy Fund in new avenues of fundraising which was very successful for us, and consulted with the San Luis Obispo Museum of Art Board of Directors on new possibilities. Libby helped bring the San Luis Obispo Botanical Garden back to financial balance, bringing in many new supporters while she served as an interim executive director. She has created an endowed fund at the Community Foundation for the benefit of Central Coast Audubon, Festival Mosaic, the History Center, Economics of Being a Woman, the Dana Adobe, and the Little Theater are all recipients of her time and talents. Libby has blazed a bright trail tirelessly and generously, sharing her expertise, her wisdom, creativity, and passion for people, the arts, and historical preservation helping to make our nonprofits in this county better than they would have been and shine for us all. Opening her purse and her heart, she is a cheerleader, a benefactor, a catalyst, and my dear friend. I'm so pleased she's received this award. Please welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm actually a person who uh, did not prepare comments because I really like to be behind the scenes and not out in front. So this is actually very difficult. And I'm going to probably cry, but that's what will happen. But what's um, amazing to me, just in this room and seeing and hearing everything to, up to this moment, is the incredible passion and the incredible diversity of the people both presenting the awards and the people receiving them. 
And I was thinking as I was sitting there that I wasn't going to say anything, but I have um, something to say about being an older person. Because as I'm listening to the first four, their passion and their careers have taken them down a certain road that um, is really thrilling to see. And then at some point in your life, you get to the end of that particular chapter, and you have to open a new door. And you think, well, what's going to come next? And my husband and I um, moved to the Central Coast because we wanted to start a new life. We had lived in the urban areas all of our lives. And we moved here for the beauty and for the quietness, and we thought we'd be under the radar. And we kind of thought our lives would be somewhat um, quiet and, you know, it would be wonderful. And we moved into a fabulous neighborhood, and my neighbors, we became a family immediately. I've never had the time in my professional life to have the friendships that I've made on this county, in this county and in this wonderful neighborhood that I live in. And even though some people are moving a little further away, they're just as tight in our family as before. But as I got into uh, thinking about later in life, the fun for me being in philanthropy has been to come into a community where I'm really not known and to be able to kind of look and, and see what needs to be done. And for me to step in and sometimes be able to be helpful and sometimes probably not be able to be helpful, but it's the idea that you can bring something new and you can see a place when you're older and you've had all kinds of life experiences, you can see a place where you might be able to make change. And I think in philanthropy, I think philanthropy is really a tough field right now. I think things are changing dramatically and the way that we will move forward because we have so many needs and we have in, in this county, as we know, many, many different nonprofits that try to meet those needs. But we're at a point where we have to begin to collaborate and cooperate and really work together on, in a much bigger way than we have in the past. And, and that's what I'm hoping that I will be able to help do going forward. And then I wanted to say, as an older person too, that I wanted to thank, thank my grandmother. I was thinking about uh, when you were talking about your moms. Um, so I was thinking about my grandmother who was born in 1885 and came, she was four foot nine, I have to say, and she married somebody who was six foot six, which is how that happened, I'm not sure. But the two of them came to Arizona. My grandfather was a mining engineer and my grandmother was raised in a really strict Victorian household. So she came to the West very excited about escaping all of that. But uh, she had to learn how to be a midwife. She had to learn how to ride horses. She had to do things that she never thought she could do. So when I was growing up, um, she was in her 70s. She's really my age. And I remember telling her once that we didn't have a Girl Scout leader and we were supposed to be getting the horseback riding badge and what were we going to do. And she said, I'll do it. So there she was, four foot nine, teaching all of us horseback riding, taking us on on trips overnight for three and four days, teaching us how to cook over a campfire, all those things she knew how to do very well. But the thing that I think is important about her, if for me, is that she's a mentor, just as some of the other people have been talking about the people important in their lives. And you know, being mentored, giving the person that feeling that you can do anything, and that's what my grandmother gave me. She said, you can do anything, let's imagine, she said, and we talk all the time about imagining a better world or a better thing to do or a better way to do something. And I hope all of us remember always, you know, to spark that imagination and to mentor others because those two things, imagination and mentoring, I do believe can make anything happen. So thank you very much for all of you, for the Community Foundation, the Cuesta Foundation, and all my dear friends. I feel a very lucky person. Thank you. And so, moving on to the Grace in Mitchell Lifetime Achievement Award. This is a very special award given to a woman with distinguished service and dedication to women in more than one of the three categories that we've already discussed and over an extended length of time throughout her professional or volunteer career. So please welcome Kay Miller to the stage with this year's award winner, Ann Robinson. an 
entourage. Can you scoot over here? Hi. Um, this presentation will be a little different. Uh, when Janice told us three minutes, we knew she probably really meant it. So we kind of took a different direction, knowing that you all will read in the program all the wonderful things that Ann has done. So I'm Kay Miller, and these lovely women behind me are Ann's book group. And <clears throat> Jill Anderson, Maggie King, and Jennifer Fulbeck. And Marcia Braun uh, is here in spirit. She's actually on a safari in Africa. But we are the slow reading sisters. And yes, that pun is intended because of our age and all of that kind of stuff. But we nominated our dear friend Ann Robinson for this award. <clears throat> and as you can see in the program, her interest in our community have been varied and many, many faceted. She was a member of Class 7 of Leadership of San Luis Obispo. She was on the board of the Pacific Repertory Opera, was a CASA volunteer, served on the grand jury, worked with the Land Conservancy, served on the board of the Children's Museum during their fundraising and remodeling phase. She has been a tremendous asset to the Community Foundation of San Luis Obispo County and was a founding member of the Women's Legacy Fund and truly embodies all the qualities of a woman of distinction with her tremendous commitment and contribution of time, effort, and heart. Now, to me personally, some words that describe Anne are adventurous, curious, bold, courageous, and collaborative. Her curiosity and sense of adventure extends to her travels. A few years ago, she and her husband Lou wanted to visit Cuba. Now, relations were starting to warm up, but the sanctions had not yet been lifted. So they contacted the State Department. She went through all the proper channels, did all the paperwork, blah, blah, blah. Suddenly, they were off to Havana. Just bold, courageous, great. And this story, I always remember this story from Book Club because I just thought she was, could have been a pioneer. The same adventurous spirit was useful one winter. They were at their cabin in Dinky Creek, and they wanted a Christmas tree, but all of a sudden it snowed and snowed and snowed, so they were snowed in. Anne hiked out in the wood, cut down the tree, dragged the tree back. They had a Christmas tree. <laughs> so to me, Anne is determined, persevering, and brave. And now I'd like to introduce Jill Anderson. Thank you, Kay. Um, well, Kay mentioned to you that we started our book group, and that's been 13 years ago, 2003. But I think that among the book group, I have the distinction of being the one who has known Anne the longest. In fact, in 1996, Anne and I were assigned to each other as tennis partners uh, at the Avila Bay Club Women's League. Um, it was both of our first year playing competitively. <laughs> we weren't terribly successful as a tennis team, but we really clicked as friends. I learned that she and her husband had just retired to the Central Coast from the Bay Area, and that she had worked with Adobe in Silicon Valley. She had also gone to Stanford, so I knew she was smart, well-educated. And in our day, we know that not a lot of women went into the uh, computer science field. She had done very well there. Um, about halfway through our tennis season, she and I were carpooling to a match, I believe, down in Santa Maria. And we were talking, and it just flashed through my mind. She might be a good addition to my Pacific Repertory Opera Board. We were always looking for good board members. Um, there were a couple of qualities that she had. She was number one new to town, therefore unencumbered. Nobody else had discovered her yet. <laughs> number two, I had already identified that she was smart and well-educated. And number three, she appeared, I don't remember how I got this sense, but she was civic-minded. I had a gut feeling about all this. So I asked her, would you be interested in being on the opera board? And when I explained what that involved, she said, yes. Well, as you might imagine, she was a wonderful board member. She served two, two three-year terms. So she was on the uh, opera board for six years. Uh, one of the things she took on was organizing all the auction items for our annual fundraiser which usually raised, I don't know, 15, 20,000 a year, which was 
in those days, pretty good change. And she also helped write grant proposals. She also even went on stage as a supernumerary, um, that is a walk-on non-singing part, in Madame Butterfly. So she and her husband both did that. So they were house servants in the um, in Madame Butterfly's, you know, geisha house. Um, anyway, the rest is history. Anne has gone on to serve so many other lo local organizations, as Kay mentioned, uh, including CASA, the Grand Jury, Leadership Slow, the Children's Museum, the Community Foundation, and now she's on the uh, Monday Club. So I'm really glad that I listened to my gut feeling about her, because I think possibly the opera was her first board in San Luis Obispo. So we got to profit from her talents first. So now I'd like to introduce my co-slow reading sister, Maggie King. Co-slow reading sister, I kind of like that. <laughs> Excuse me. Hello, everybody. We all had decided we wanted to come up with an adjective that, that, said, that spoke to us about Anne. And it's really hard when you're trying to come to one adjective with an amazing woman like Anne. You can do beautiful, smart, kind, generous, hardworking, civic-minded, civic -minded, every, everything good. She's all of that and more. But the word that kept coming to my mind was resilient. And I wanted to make sure I was using it correctly, so I did what we all do when we need complete and accurate advice. I Googled it. Um, <laughs> and this is what I came up with. Resilience is the ineffable quality that allows some people to be knocked down by life and come back stronger than ever. Recovering readily from illness, depression, adversity, or the like, able to endure tribulation without cracking, able to become strong, healthy, and successful anytime after something bad happens. Our book group's been together for 13 years, so we know each other pretty well. And during that time, we've all had a lot of, you know, the normal losses and grieving periods. And um, I've always felt like, sorry guys, I think you're all cool, but um, I've always felt like Anne was the strongest in, of all of us in terms of recovering. She just, she's amazed me in her ability to bounce back and get back on the horse after her recent terrible loss in her determination to move forward and be positive, she has just blown my mind up completely. She hasn't missed a beat. She's just returned just in time to, to be here with us today from Patagonia. She has spent time just recently immersing herself in Spanish in Mexico, among other, other trips. She just does it all and does it no matter what happens. And I admire her more than I can say. Hi, I'm Jennifer Fulbeck, another slow reader. <laughs> Many of you I know have come up to Anne before the proceedings began to congratulate her. So I know there are many of you out there who have had the privilege of working with Anne in her capacity as a community leader. I have a different perspective. I met Anne in 2003 when we both uh, became members of the book group didn't know anything about Anne. I think I may have known that she had served on the opera board, but, but that, that was all that I knew about her. But my first impressions of Anne were that she was quietly gracious and unassuming, and I knew that I was going to enjoy getting to know Anne over uh, the years that we would be in this book group, which I knew was going to last a long time. As all book groups do, we have our modus operandi, and there are two main rules. One is that whoever is hosting the next month's book group must bring with her a collection of books that she is interested in reading, and then the group as a whole selects the book that they will read the next time. The second rule is we cannot pick a book that someone else has read. So you've got a group of readers, and you're looking for a book that no one in the group has read. It became apparent that we had a challenge on our hands. And I would very quietly and graciously raise her hand and say, I've read that. Oh, OK, Anne. Well, let's look at what else we have here. I probably wouldn't recommend that book. 
oh, that's a good one. It got harder and harder, especially as the others of us started reading. So we all come with bags of books so that we can find a book that Anne hasn't read. The challenge has been great because it's expanded all of our reading horizons, um, especially given that Anne's list of books that she brings are informed by all of her travels, which everyone has, has referenced here at the podium tonight. And she would bring books that were written by Africans, South Americans, Mid-Easterners, a few Americans, but we were all very, very challenged by her inquisitiveness and things that she knew about and was introducing us to, and it has made the, the group very, very rich. How did she do it? How did she read that many books, do all that traveling? How did she do it? Now, keep in mind, that's only the tip of the iceberg. I did not know about her community efforts and all of the work that she had done in the community. When it was finally revealed to me, it was not revealed to me by Anne. It was revealed to me by others. Anne is very self-effacing. She just loves being up here on stage. I know <laughs> this is just delighting her no end. I found out about Anne's accomplishments, not from Anne, but from others. Don't get me wrong. Anne is the first one to share the experiences that she's having on her board if she's, a, if she's directly asked. But it's not going to be volunteered. She will, with enthusiasm, tell you what each of the groups that she's serving on is doing. But she always speaks in terms of they, and occasionally, but never I. It's not about Anne. It's about serving the community and making sure that these organizations are achieving their goals. And when you think about the adjectives that everyone here tonight has brought to the microphone, all of those have served to make her the community leader that she has been for San Luis Obispo. I have enjoyed greatly, Anne, getting to know you. And I appreciate everything you've done for the community. I think that the selflessness that Anne brings to the table is probably her strongest, her strongest advantage in becoming the power that she has been. And I would like to bring her to the microphone so that we can all applaud her selfless efforts on behalf of San Luis Obispo County. We are very lucky to have you. I'm avoiding having to say anything. Um, you can see why I love my book group. They're really a wonderful group, and we have a great time together. Uh, thank you. Thank the Women's Legacy Fund, the Cuesta College. Uh, and I really didn't have anything prepared, so I don't know what to say, except um, those were good stories. I'd forgotten some of that. <laughs> and I think Libby said a lot of what I'd or some of what I'd say about moving here, finding it such a great community. Lou and I both loved it here, and living here, it's just good to be able to help to do something for others. And I'm really sorry he isn't here with me, and I wasn't going to lose it, sorry. But thank you all. Um, it's amazing just to look out here at everybody. What a kind, supportive hardworking group of people this is who do a lot to help each other. Thank you all. Thank you so much to all of you for coming today and supporting Cuesta College and the Community Foundation's efforts 
to recognize women in our community who make a difference. Wow, it got to me. Oh. I feel so lucky to be part of a community with so many inspiring people. Hearing what they've accomplished, the dreams that have inspired them, the obstacles that they've overcome, it makes me very hopeful for the future. And we have to remember that it's never too late to chase your dreams. You're never too much or too little of anything. And these ladies show we can go after big issues and we can make a difference. So in closing, I'll leave you with one last Irish proverb. As you ramble through life, whatever be your goal, keep your eye on the donut and not on the hole. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here today. I'm looking forward to seeing you all at the Women's Legacy Fund luncheon in September. And I would like to invite our award recipients and their nominees and their, their nominators to come back up and have some photos. Let's please give all of our award recipients another round of applause. award winners and their nominators. We'll have you meet outside if you can gather by this door. Thank you so much and thank you all for being here. <laughs>